Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Let's say we end this Zelda marathon. We've come quite a long way since Link's robust beginnings on the NES, and as we've seen, the Zelda franchise as a whole is quite capable of making quality titles for each system it debuts on. But how do you go making a direct follow-up to something like Ocarina of Time? I mean, the same could be said for when Ocarina of Time had to follow up on Link to the Past, but Ocarina of Time left some massive shoes to fill. The follow-up to Ocarina of Time was originally an expansion of the original game called Yura Zelda, which included alternate level designs very similar to that of those showcased in the Master Quest version of Ocarina of Time. It was meant for the Nintendo 64 disk drive, an expansion that allowed for additional memory to make bigger games, kind of like the Jaguar CD for the Atari Jaguar. And just like the Jaguar CD, it was a commercial failure and never released outside of Japan. In short time, development of Yura Zelda was cancelled and another project known as Zelda Gaiden was soon started, which would later be retitled as The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask, released from the Nintendo 64 in October of 2000. I may not own the gold card for Ocarina at time, but at least I have the gold card of this, though I think every copy of Majora's Mask was gold now that I think about it. The cover art is even holographic, which kind of makes it hard to distinguish from afar, but it's still pretty cool. So, a direct sequel to Ocarina of Time. Is it what the fans wanted? Does it fill the shoes of its absurdly popular predecessor? Well, for the sake of ending this Zelda marathon, let's find out now. Oh, and if you plan on playing this on an original N64, you're gonna need the expansion pack, which allowed for some games to pack higher quality textures and things like that. No expansion pack, no Majora's Mask. Me and Majora's Mask have a bit of history together as far back as its initial release. I I especially remember the commercials for this one back in the year 2000, particularly the one with World Wrestling Federation's Hardy Boy stopping in the middle of a match to watch some random kid play Majora's Mask. He's got 72 hours to save the world. 72 hours to save the world? I always knew Zelda games were about stopping the bad guy and saving the day, but why the three day time limit for this one? Remember how I said I first experienced Ocarina of Time with the Zelda collection for the Nintendo GameCube? Well, almost immediately after finishing Ocarina of Time, I jumped right into Majora's Mask, and then I just stopped playing it only about an hour and a half into it. So what happened? But to be honest, the whole three day time limit of Majora's Mask was extremely daunting to me. If there's one thing I hate feeling in a video game, it's pressured. I ended up not doing much in the game to begin with, and then I moved on to Wind Waker in the summer of 2004. Maybe because I was already exhausted with Zelda for the time being after just finishing Ocarina of Time or Outside Elements or something else, but I just dropped it. It wasn't until late 2011 when I became interested once more. This was from a number of things. One, Ben Drown, the creepypasta center on Majora's Mask that I recommend you give a read, I think it's pretty good. Along with the accompanying videos you can find on YouTube. Secondly, there was my best friend Matthew who proceeded to show me the ropes. In due time, I found myself purchasing the original cartridge, the expansion pack, and I spent hours upon hours playing the game and truly seeing what it was all about. I couldn't put it down. Whatever really prevented me from enjoying the game back in 2004 was completely eradicated at this point. However, I know you guys didn't come to hear me over-explain my past with Majora's Mask, so let's get into it. Being a direct sequel to Ocarina of Time, what does someone like Link do when Ganondorf is out of the picture? The game begins in a dense forest, which I'm assuming is part of the Kokiri Forest, but I'm not exactly sure. The game explains to us that Link is searching for a valuable friend that accompanied him during his time-traveling journey in Ocarina of Time, which is strongly implied to be Navi the Fairy, who, as we saw last time, pretty much ditched Link after saving the world and placing the Master Sword back in the pedestal. I'm not sure if Link just wants to have a proper goodbye or is on a secret stalking mission, but in the middle of his journey, two forest fairies who go by the name of Tattle and Tail scare Pona, causing Link to fall off her back, rendering him temporarily unconscious. Accompanying the two fairies is a Skull Kid wearing a strange mask. Taking advantage of the situation, the masked Skull Kid pilfers the Ocarina of Time from Link, but Link soon wakes up and attempts to get the instrument back, causing Skull Kid to hijack Epona and ride off. Giving chase, Link ends up stumbling right off of a hidden cliff and takes a rather steep fall through a sweet rave party, transporting him out of Hyrule and into the world of Termina. The masked Kid, after spending a minute taunting our hero of time, proceeds to then transform Link into a Deku scrub, prompting Link to have the appropriate reaction. <laughs> The masked kid leaves, ditching Tattle in the process, leaving her with a most likely traumatized Link. Tattle is very quick to apologize and asks Link to help her get back to her brother's side. Link agrees and winds up in a clock tower where a mysterious man greets him. Players of Ocarina of Time will recognize this guy as the Happy Masked Salesman, a person who had no significance in Ocarina of Time's story and only served as a side quest where he had to sell borrowed masks for profit. Mr. Smiles here tells Link that he can help Link return to his normal state, but he'll need to get the Ocarina of Time back from the Skull Kid first. In exchange, the salesman asks Link to get his precious mask back, which was stolen from him by the Skull Kid. To make things more interesting, Happy here also tells Link that he only has 72 hours to complete the task. You're not exactly sure why you only have 72 hours at first, but as soon as you walk outside, you can see the answer for yourself. 
Thanks to the masked Skull Kid, the moon, complete with a face, is slowly falling towards the land of Termina. In three days, the moon will crash, killing everybody in the process. I mean, shit. As the Deku scrub, you won't be able to do much. The guards won't let you leave Clocktown because you're an unsupervised child, and the townspeople are either indifferent to what's around them or just flat out racist to Dekus. Using his abilities as a Deku scrub, Link eventually finds the means to confront the masked Skull Kid just mere minutes before the moon crashes. Cutting it a little close there, don't you think, Link? Link and Tattle encounter the Skull Kid on top of the clock tower, where Tattle's brother goes off about summoning four beings that are located in four different places across the land of Termina to stop the moon from falling. With the power of spit, Deku Link manages to knock the ocarina out of the Skull Kid's hands and takes it back. Link then suddenly has a flashback of Princess Zelda, who reminds Link of the Song of Time which he can use to call forth the aid of the Goddess of Time and travel back in time before the moon crashes on Termina. After playing the Song of Time, Link is sent back to the beginning of the three-day cycle with the ocarina still in his possession. Link heads back to Mr. Salesman, where he teaches Link the Song of Healing, which transforms our hero back to normal. Unfortunately, Link didn't get the mask back as promised, prompting Mr. Smiles here to have a psychotic episode for about a few seconds before calmly telling Link the importance of getting the mask back from the Skull Kid. The mask, now known as Majora's Mask, was rumored to be a mask used during ancient Hexen rituals. Whoever wears the mask is bestowed with terrifying dark powers, which, needless to say, can lead to utter havoc now that it's on the face of what can be the equivalent of a kid on a sugar rush. So why exactly was this mask in possession of Creepy Smile here? Well, that's never really explained, but at this point it doesn't really matter. Your biggest focus at this point is just trying to get the mask back to prevent Armageddon. Now that Link is back to normal, it's up to him to travel all across Termina and awaken the four mysterious beings before the moon nukes everything in sight. And just how the fuck are you supposed to do that in under three days? Well, that's where the Ocarina of Time comes into play. In Ocarina of Time, the instrument itself was mainly used as a means to solve certain puzzles, warp to different areas across Hyrule after learning the proper song, and playing some minigames to earn rewards. In this game, it's your lifesaver. You might have noticed this little indicator right here by now. That's your clock. Time is always always flowing in the land of Termina, whether you're outside, inside a building, a cave, everywhere, and after three days, it's game over. A day in the world of Termina is about 18 minutes long in real time, so multiply that by three, and you have a measly 54 minutes to travel to each location in Termina, complete the dungeons, and save the world. That's of course assuming you don't know how to use the Ocarina of Time effectively, which, back when I first played the game in 2004, I did not. A little exploration in Clock Town will teach you a few songs that can alter the flow of time itself. When you play the Song of Time backwards, you can slow down the flow of time, which, trust me when I say this, takes a tremendous amount of pressure off of the player. The inverted Song of Time will make your journey a fuckload more comfortable. It basically triples the amount of time the three-day cycle lasts. So now you have nearly three hours to save the world, but there's much more to it than that. At any point during your adventure, you can play the Song of Time to reset the clock and begin the three-day cycle all over again. Doing so not only resets time, but side quests as well. You'll also lose any rupees you've collected or items like Deku sticks or bombs or arrows, any perishable item in your possession. However, this doesn't count towards upgrades like dungeon treasures or the many masks you can collect after completing side quests. If you complete a dungeon before the three-day cycle ends, the plot important mask you obtain also stays with you, so you don't have to complete the dungeon over again when you eventually reset time. Look, I don't know why the Goddess of Time is so picky with what you can bring back in time with you, but luckily it's extremely easy for us to get consumable items back. The land of Termina is much more condensed than Hyrule feel from the last game. Refilling your stock is as easy as killing a choo-choo or slashing the numerous bushes placed all over Termina. It's also extremely easy to get rupees in this game, more so than any other Zelda game so far. There's even a bank in Clock Town where you can store your rupees, which will still be there even when you reset time. Bank fraud. The trick to beating Majora's Mask is effectively utilizing the Ocarina of Time to manipulate time and conquer the four dungeons Termina contains. Yes, you heard me right, there are only four dungeons in this game. One in the southern swamp, one located in the snowy mountains, one in a vast ocean, and one across a tall canyon. When you defeat the boss inside the dungeon, you're awarded with the dungeon's mask, and since it stays with you even during a time reset, this does not mean you have to tackle all four dungeons in one three-day cycle. You will, however, need to collect all four dungeon masks to beat the game. With only four dungeons to complete, it's only natural to assume Majora's Mask is a short game. Well, it can be, you could technically get away with the bare minimum and complete the game in probably a few days if you want it. However, you'd be missing out on about 75% of the game. Majora's Mask is all about the side quests. After you obtain the Ocarina back from the Skull Kid and transform back to normal, the main story takes a huge backseat. 
The only other piece of story we get is a little backstory showing how Tato and Tell became friends with the once friendly Skull Kid before taking Majora's Mask from Mr. Smiles here. You could argue that there's less story here than Ocarina of Time, but the real focus on Majora's Mask is the land of Termina itself. The many locations of Termina are jam-packed with time-specific events and characters that have their own stories to explore. Almost everybody in this world has a schedule based on the time of the day, and the key to helping people with their problems is knowing what to do, how to do it, and most importantly, when to do it. The game encourages you to talk and check just about everything, not only to learn how to properly complete a side quest, but to learn more about Termina itself. I like to think of it like Metroid Prime, where discovering more about Talon 4 was all whether or not you like the scan data logs and the like. You don't have to do it, but it's there if you want to learn more about the world itself. Since there are only 4 dungeons in the game, that means you can only grab a total of 4 complete heart containers to permanently extend your health meter. If you want more hearts, you gotta collect heart pieces, and holy shit there's a lot of them in this game. A total of 52. Like I said, the game really wants you to explore Termina and complete side quests not just for the sake of the people, but also for the sake of you lasting longer in this unsettling place. Termina is nothing like Hyrule, both from a visual standpoint and its structure. There's no Zelda to be seen, there's no three goddesses of Hyrule, no Master Sword, and no Triforce, but as I stated in Link's Awakening, I don't necessarily need these things to have a good Zelda game. This world is such a visual contrast to Hyrule. It's packed with bright colors, weird structures, bizarre locations, and it's also close to each other. You can look north on the map and spot the snowy mountains of Snowhead, and then make a 90 degree turn to spot the barren wasteland of Ikana. And you know what? I actually like this setup. I thought Hyrule Field in the last game was too big and uninteresting for its own good, and while this setup may scream clusterfuck to some, I welcome this condensation. Majora's Mask definitely takes advantage of the added memory made possible with the expansion pack. This game has more graphical finesse, better atmosphere, and higher quality textures. It not only keeps me visually interested, but I have a much more enjoyable time traveling here than I did in Hyrule Field. The people you can meet and help in this world also make this world feel truly alive, and also incredibly depressing. Sometimes helping someone is as simple as getting a red potion from the shop and giving it to someone to heal their injuries. Other times, it could be as grim as sending someone's soul to rest, or watching someone collapse and die in front of your very eyes to fulfill their dying requests. I'm not exaggerating when I say that the world of Termina can be fucking creepy, and it just gets worse and worse the longer you let the current 3 day cycle pass without doing anything. It doesn't help that you have the face of the apocalypse constantly staring at you no matter where you go, but just about every location in this place is suffering from some sort of plague and whatnot. The swamp is decaying from poisoned water, the Gorons in Snowland are on the verge of freezing to death, the ocean waters are becoming more and more dangerous, and the spirits of Ikana Valley are unable to rest, causing trouble to the living. Termina is pretty fucked up. Let's look at the Romani Ranch for example, which you can only normally visit on the third day of the three day cycle. Just approaching the young Romani in the ranch alerts you that something isn't quite right about this place. Romani looks completely out of it, as if she got lobotomized or something, and when you speak to her older sister in the barn, she mentions something about their cows going missing and looks to be filled with regret. It's only when you obtain the means to enter the Romani ranch earlier in the 3 day cycle that you discover that ghostly creatures invaded their ranch, stole their cows, and did something to Romani. By helping Romani fend off the cow stealing aliens, you can prevent all of that from happening and save the ranch. Majora's Mass is filled with side quests like this, which leaves me with a wonderful feeling of satisfaction whenever I successfully complete a side quest such as this. In the last review, I brought up that I couldn't connect with Link in the slightest because he doesn't have any emotional connection to anybody. In this game, that doesn't matter because I, myself, connect with these people. Majora's Mask not only does a good job in creating likable characters, but also does a good job making me laugh with his humorous dialogue. Because of this, I want to help these people. I want to see these people overcome their problems or put them at ease. Whether it's the troubled couple of Anjo and Keifei, or the bickering townspeople that refuse to believe that the moon is actually falling. No other Zelda game at this point has made me feel such a way about the residents within its own world, and I applaud this game for making me do so. When you visit the milk bar just mere hours before the moon crashes, the barkeep will tell you that he wished he got to see his favorite customer before dying, and that his wish came true when you walked inside the bar. That just tugs on my heartstrings, man. I know it's just a bunch of polygons, but why is it making me feel so sad? It isn't just about stopping the moon from annihilating the world, but helping everybody deal with their personal problems before doing so. Now, I want to help the people of Termina to get mass, and I want to complete minigames to get heart pieces, but sometimes the process of doing so can be a bit tiring. First off, some of the minigames need to play to score item expansions and heart pieces can be really fucking strict. I'm not really a fan of the shooting gallery inside the clock town because the analog control isn't as precise as I'd like it to be. Rupees may not be hard to collect in this game, but they won't stop you from spending a shitload of cash anyway just to try and try again. <laughs> 
Some side quests can also be very time consuming for different reasons. Sometimes you need to win a game three days in a row to nab a heart piece, which can put a damper on your current schedule. Helping Romani fend off the aliens requires you to meet her in the barn at 2 in the morning. You can help alleviate the waiting time by playing the song of double time, which immediately warps you to 6pm of the current day, or 6am of the next day. If you're not of the multitasking type and don't want to risk missing the appointment, you may find yourself just standing around waiting for the appointed time to arrive, which has happened to me on a number of occasions. <sighs> oh, hello there, Mr. Cuckoo. Fine night to be killing aliens. Son of a bitch! I hope the aliens took you after Christmas! And let's not get started on helping Andrew and Kayfei, the troubled couple. This particular side quest will take you an entire three day cycle to complete, and if you fuck up at the very end trying to help Kayfei get his mask back, you'll need to time travel to the beginning of the three day cycle and start the entire side quest again. You also need to do it twice if you plan on getting every heart piece in the game. Yeah, thanks, game! But it is heartwarming to see the two reunite after completing the side quest, even when it's just mere minutes before the moon falls. No, oh, that's real sweet, guys. I'm gonna go reverse time now and completely undo this for the sake of saving the world. Oh, I guess you won't be needing this chest of rupees either. I'll just take those right out of your hands. A major focus of Majora's masks are masks themselves. Some act as a means to complete a side quest, while others can be an extension to Link's abilities. For the sake of time, I'll just say that Link controls exactly how he did in Ocarina of Time, and a majority of his arsenal returns from that game as well. With masks, however, you can spruce things up a bit. A lot of them are optional, but I heavily recommend going out of your way to get these babies. Some of them seriously rock like the Blast Mask, which almost completely eliminates the need for regular bombs. If you help this guy turn his chicks into full-grown roosters, you can add the Bunny Hood, which doubles Link's running speed while equipped. Yes, thank you! As someone who seriously missed the Pegasus Boots from A Link to the Past, this is truly a blessing. Then there's the Stone Mask, which, as you can probably guess from the design of the mask, makes you completely undetectable to enemies. What, you couldn't tell from the design that it makes you practically invisible? Come on, really? The most important masks are of the transformation variety. When Link is returned to his normal state, his Deku Scrub persona is transformed into a mask that he can equip to transform back into the Deku Scrub form at any time. Later in the game, as you approach the dungeons, you'll score the Goron mask, transforming Link into a hard-hitting Goron, and the Zora mask, making Link incredibly pale and a few inches taller. Each transformation brings a set of new abilities that Link must exploit to complete the game. The Deku Scrub can skim across water for a short period of time and make use of launch flowers to travel large distances in the air. The Goron form makes Link incredibly durable in battle, and he can roll into a ball to pick up a tremendous amount of speed at the cost of some magic points. This is one of my favorite techniques in the game, as it makes traveling from one location to another a complete non-issue. Yeah, you get Epona back later down the road, but even she doesn't come close to the matching speed of the rolling Goron. The Zora Mask makes Link a fantastic swimmer. No more need for Iron Boost to sink to the surface or relying on the hookshot to battle enemies underwater, as Zora Link is perfectly capable of defending himself with martial arts, boomerang fins, and an electrical shield which provides great coverage. With these masks at his disposal, in addition to his available arsenal as a human being, we're talking about an extremely versatile Link here. No matter what the terrain or obstacle, Link can tackle just about anything with a proper mask, leading this Link to be one of my favorite incarnations of Link in the history of the franchise. It's a good thing Link is so handy too, because he's going to need everything he has if he plans on completing the game's dungeons. There may be only four of them, but these places are among the most perplexing and difficult dungeons in the series so far. Combined with the time limit, you have the ingredients to make for a seriously tense experience. There's a lot more rooms to travel in and more puzzles to solve than ever. Not only do you have to utilize Link's natural abilities to press switches, shoot something to open a door, or push a block, but now you also have to use your mask forms as well to solve the unique puzzles that dungeons contain. Each dungeon also contains 15 stray fairies that you can collect to obtain a magic upgrade from the Great Fairy when you recombine them at the proper place. Woodfall Temple isn't so bad, well, it's the first dungeon, it's not supposed to be, but I certainly find it more puzzling than the Great Deku Forest in Ocarina of Time, or the first three dungeons in Ocarina of Time in general. The boss of the temple, Odawa, is one of my favorite bosses in the game. I don't know the exact reason, but I guess it might be the chanting and the way he moves. Snowhead Temple isn't too dangerous, but damn does it take forever. It reminds me a lot of the Ice Palace from A Link to the Past, in which you have to deal with ice physics at times, and there's so many fucking floors. It's also easy to lose track of yourself, mainly when you're trying to complete the dungeon itself while collecting the stray fairies on top of that. The boss is a giant mechanical beast named Goat, who can be really fun to fight when you chase him down with the Goron roll, but what kind of name is Goat? However, it doesn't get any more confusing than the Great Bay Temple. Fuck this place. Seriously. If you didn't like the Water Temple in Ocarina of Time, oh boy are you gonna hate this place! You have to travel in so many rooms and constantly reverse the flow of water to reach new areas and find the treasure, the stray fairies, and finally the boss. 
With the clock constantly ticking, even with the use of the inverted Song of Time, I recommend using some outside assistance to clear this one. The dungeon map and the compass can only help so much. I thought Goat was an odd name for a boss, but the boss of the Great Bay Temple is named George. Okay, maybe that's not how it's pronounced, but it looks like George to me, so I'm going to call him George. The last temple is the Stone Tower Temple, high up in the Ikana Canyon. Getting to this place is a pain in the ass because you constantly need to use the Ocarina song, The Elegy of Emptiness, to materialize clones of yourself and your mass forms to press multiple switches. If that wasn't bad enough, look at these clones! What the fuck, man? Why do they all look so fucking freaky? This particular one was the inspiration for a successful ghost story. What's with that fucking face? Anyway, Stone Tower is among the longest dungeons in the game, but it's really fun to travel in. It's always throwing something new at you, so you're always keeping your eyes peeled, and the gravity-based puzzles are pretty cool. Getting the stray fairies requires a lot of backtracking though, that's my only real complaint about it. I don't have much to say about the boss Twin Mold, because the giant smash you get inside Stone Tower, combined with the power of the Chateau Romani, which gives you infinite magic power for the remainder of the 3 day cycle, makes this guy a total pushover. Finishing a dungeon and collecting the mash releases one of the four giants of Termina who act as guardians to the entire land. When you finish all four temples, you finally have the means to confront the Skull Kid on the night of the final day. When the Skull Kid attempts to crash the moon into Termina, Link summons the four giants with his ocarina, who proceed to stop the moon from touching the surface and render the Skull Kid unconscious. Unfortunately, Majora's Mass ends up being sentient and possesses the moon itself to finish the job, with the giants barely holding the damn thing up. Link enters the moon itself to confront Majora, and this is where things start getting weird. First off, this is what the inside of the moon looks like. What the fuck is going on here? Secondly, there's a bunch of wandering kids inside, all wearing the masks we collected upon defeating the dungeon bosses. Thirdly, these kids all look like young versions of the Happy Mask Salesman, which really makes me question the origins of this asshole immediately. Fourthly, it's here where you discover the reasoning behind Majora's want of mayhem and destruction. It's all just a game to him. The way a child finds a game of cops and robbers or hide and seek fun, this fucker kills and causes misery because it's fun to him. God damn, that's mean. If you collected all the optional masks in the game, this is where you can obtain the fierce deity mask, which Majora himself gives you to make this game more interesting. What the fuck is the matter with this guy? Well, to go off on a tangent, the Fierce Deity Mask is awesome, but it's a game breaker. You can only use it during boss battles, but with it on, you can't possibly lose. The final battle between Link and Majora is in this colorful mess of an arena. The first part isn't so bad, especially with the Fierce Deity Mask I mentioned earlier, but like Ganondorf himself, Majora has a second form upon defeat in the first form, and it's batshit insane. Look at this thing, it's running around like a chicken without its head. It does the Cossack, it even fucking moonwalks. This is my third time facing this guy, and I'm still not sure how to assess this creature. Even after dealing with this crazy form, Majora has a third form, where it's definitely the most dangerous seeing that it's rocking double whips, but with the use of the light arrows you get in Stone Tower, it's actually not a hard fight at all. When Link delivers the final blow, Majora disintegrates into oblivion, returning the moon back to normal and thus saving the land of Termina. The four giants make their leave and the Skull Kid is back to his normal self as well. The Skull Kid is actually a character you can meet in Ocarina of Time in the Lost Woods, where you can earn a heart piece if you played him sorry a song on the stump. Skull Kid even makes reference to this when he takes a second to identify Link. The Happy Mask Salesman takes the now powerless Majora's Mask back and exits the scene while congratulating Link for a job well done. You know, I was enjoying the ending before you went and made me uncomfortable, you fucking jerk. I guess even ambiguously evil characters such as him need closure too. With Terminus saved, Link takes Epona and rides off where I assume he continues his search for Navi. The residents of Termina celebrate the carnival of time, now with 100% less apocalypse. Out of all the endings I've experienced in the Zelda franchise, this one in particular really stands out to me. Seeing as I went out of my way to help everyone's problems, this ending shows me the aftermath. Everyone is happy, or at least in a more comfortable position, and it makes me feel good knowing that I helped contribute toward it. I love this credits theme to death too. In fact, Majora's Mask is my favorite soundtrack in the entire series. I know I angered a lot of you last time when I didn't find a lot of Ocarina of Time's soundtrack to be very memorable, and while it's true that Majora's Mask reuses a few themes from Ocarina of Time, the original musical pieces created specifically for this game are among the greatest songs I've ever heard for the series. Not only are they composed wonderfully, but they also fit perfectly within the setting of Termina. It's a dark soundtrack, and puts you in a certain mood when you listen to it. They also make for great atmospheric pieces, and while Ocarina of Time did well in that department too, these are songs that actually get stuck in my head for a very long time. It's all subjective, I know, but I've only been fully playing this game for over a year, and I can't get enough of this damn soundtrack. And that's it. That's The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask. I don't know why Zelda's name is in the title of this game, considering she only appears on a flashback in the beginning of the game, but regardless of such, this is a game that has grown on me exponentially. The only major issue I have with Majora's Mask in terms of structure is its rather slow beginning. 
I mean, for the first hour or two, you're not even controlling Link in his natural form, and seeing as how things don't begin to pick up until the night of the final day where you can get your ocarina back, it could be draining for the first time player. They give you three days as Deku Link to explore Clocktown and get yourself familiar with the functionalities of the game, but seeing as you can't even leave Clocktown or do much besides playing a quick minigame or chasing after small children, I'd imagine it might be boring for some. As a person who was just as skeptical upon picking up the game again over a year ago, trust me when I say this, the game gets much better. It gets a fuck ton better. The heavy focus on side quests may not be everyone's cup of tea, and a small amount of dungeons may turn off hardcore Zelda enthusiasts, but after replaying the game for the review, and right after Ocarina of Time, I can now classify this as my favorite 3D Zelda game. When I began to record footage for this review, I just couldn't put the controller down. What was supposed to be 1 hour sessions turned into 5 hour sessions. Exploring Terminal for heart pieces, the way the game set up, using abilities and upgrades to complete side quests, getting immersed in the game's world, I just got lost in it all. That's never happened with me in Ocarina of Time. I do enjoy that game, and to be honest, it's probably more accessible when compared to this game, but when it comes to the overall experience, I think Majora's Mask trumps it. A lot of you may not agree, and I'm expecting a lot of you not to agree, but that's genuinely what I think. My top pick is still A Link to the Past just for the fun factor and accessibility, but this is what I call a fantastic 3D Zelda game. Just remember to give it a shot on an actual N64. God, I hate playing Ocarina songs on an analog stick. Fuck! I wasn't sure if my opinion of Majora's Mask would change after doing the Zelda marathon, but as soon as I grabbed the controller and took control of Link, a lot of things just seemed to open up in my head, you know? Matt, if you're watching this, and you probably are, thanks. I'm really looking forward to the Let's Play after we do Ocarina of Time. I have to ask though, where's my Majora's Mask 3D? Come on Nintendo, Ocarina of Time 3D sold like hotcakes, you're remaking Wind Waker for the Wii U, and you're making a sequel to A Link to the Past, which I'm incredibly grateful for, but where's the love for Majora's Mask? I know it's probably only a matter of time, but I'd like a more concrete yes or no. Well then guys, that's the end of the Legend of Zelda Marathon. Look, I know that a lot of you were hoping that I'd tackle Wind Waker and Twilight Princess and Skyward Sword, but quite frankly guys, I'm zelda out. I'm also a little tired of the whole month of and marathon thing for the time being, so I want to focus on some individual times before tackling another marathon. I know a lot of you guys are patient enough to wait for the day I return to the Zelda franchise, but in the meantime, there are other games to review. So, with all that said, I hope you guys enjoyed the Zelda Marathon. You guys have a great night, thank you for watching, and take care.